Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, it is my pleasure to present to you Professor Nobuo Kazashi from uh, the Graduate School of Humanities at Kobe University, Japan. Um, it's, Professor Kazashi is my personal mentor as well as a friend, and it's a great pleasure for me to be able to present him to you today, tonight. Um, Professor Kazashi works at Kobe, uh, got his MA from Tokyo University of Foreign Studies, and he uh, got his PhD from Yale University. And he's a specialist in many different fields, from American pragmatism to Japanese uh, studies and philosophy. So I think we're going to have an interesting lecture, and I hope even more interesting discussion afterward. So without further ado, I present to you Professor Kazashi. Thank you very much, Zubancho, for a uh, nice, uh, generous introduction. So uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, uh, and so I'm very delighted and honored to be able to talk to you tonight. And the, when I was asked to come to uh, come here, uh, I wondered what I can talk about, you know. Uh, but uh, I chose uh, to talk uh, about Murakami Haruki uh, for some reasons. Uh, one reason is that uh, at Kobe University, uh, one of the seminars I'm teaching is for foreign students uh, in English, and for foreign students who are not necessarily uh, studying uh, Japanese language. And so, and every year I, I choose some text uh, related to Japanese culture and uh, literature or philosophy, but not really in a very uh, narrow sense, uh, philosophy text. And the, uh, this year, uh, before the summer, I, um, we read an essay on Murakami Haruki. And the, one of the reasons is that, uh, of course, uh, I guess some of you also have read some, of, some works by Murakami Haruki, I guess. And uh, I'm curious, uh, could you raise your hand if you have read some works? Maybe it looks like many one fourth, not so many as I expected. Uh, and there's another reason, as you may know, Murakami Haruki was born in Kyoto, but he moved uh, quickly to uh, Kobe area, and he went to uh, he spent uh, his uh, uh, teenage uh, uh, time until uh, he left a uh, high school and to come up to, uh, uh, to Tokyo to study at the Waseda University where Professor uh, Morioka is now teaching. And uh, so uh, there's some association with Murakami Haruki uh, in Kobe. And so uh, and, and another reason is uh, when I had a talk with foreign students, I came to feel that there's a gap in the kind of image I had about Murakami Haruki and uh, some of the foreign students had about him. And so I wondered where this difference comes from. So that I became more interested in and uh, I read more and uh, now I came, I feel that now I understand uh, what uh, really at at the core of uh, his uh, literary uh, work and career. So uh, uh, to that, tonight, I'd like to share uh, some of my thoughts with you. And uh, uh, I'd be delighted if we, uh, if we can have some uh, exchange after my talk. I try to finish my talk in around uh, 15 minutes or so, at the longest. So uh, the title is, uh, Haruki Murakami's Commitments, uh, Music, Running, and Underground. <coughs> Violence and Narratives in Contemporary Japan. And the underground here uh, can have more than one meaning. Uh, of course, it can mean uh, a subway, 
and also literally it can mean in the underground. Yeah. And uh, also psychologically it can mean unconscious. I think in Murakami Haruki, uh, these three sort of meanings uh, are mixed together. And uh, uh, let me talk about it. So, so he was born in 1949, and as I said, he, he was uh, raised in Kobe and moved, uh, 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 came to Tokyo to spend uh, his uh, student years and he's basically uh, 20s. And after that, uh, he went after initial so, so literary success, he decided to go to Europe and the US and uh, spending, uh, I guess, almost uh, 10 years or so. And, uh, but he decided to come back to Japan. Uh, that happened to coincide with the 1995 Kobe earthquake and the Tokyo subway siren attack, uh, you may know. Uh, so uh, in the latter half of my talk, I'd like to sort of uh, present uh, some of his ideas about Japanese contemporary society and the role of storytelling or narrative. Uh, uh, in dealing with uh, violence and the problems in Japan. And uh, uh, lastly, if there's some time left, I'd like to present uh, my own uh, sort of uh, uh, thoughts and some, uh, some critics, critical views about Murakami Haruki. So this is uh, just an abstract. So uh, before going into uh, uh, Murakami Haruki, let me uh, give you a, a very broad background, historical, uh, geographical. So Kobe uh, has a very special place in modern Japanese thought. And uh, so very quickly, for example, there's a, uh, a philosopher, Watsuji Tetsuro, uh, who was born in uh, Okayama Prefecture, uh, Himeji. Uh, and he, one of his works known is called uh, Fudo. Uh, uh, difficult to translate, but basically it is about uh, environment. And, uh, but before writing this book, he went to uh, Europe, especially uh, Germany. And <coughs> during these days, you know, uh, today we can move easily between Japan and China and Europe and the US uh, by airplanes. But these days, people had to use uh, ships. It, it takes many months, right? So when Japanese scholars, intellectuals, went out to uh, Europe or the US, usually it is from Kobe port that, that went out and they came, up, uh, came back. So in the case of uh, Philosopher Watsuji Tetsuro, uh, on his way to Europe, he stopped by a various ports in Asia and uh, in the Arab countries. So, and uh, he says he was literally astonished when saw the real desert in the Arab country. Of course, there's a word uh, uh, sabak, meaning uh, desert in Japanese language, but he has never, he had never seen the real uh, large-scale desert. So, and he came to realize there are huge, really huge difference in uh, geography and the so, and the, what he wrote was this book, Fudo, Environment. And uh, there are some uh, sort of uh, problems of uh, overgeneralization, uh, but uh, simply because it is about uh, environment, natural environment. Uh, 
there's a sort of increase, renewed in interest uh, in this work. And uh, <coughs> another case, uh, scholar uh, Kato Shuichi, uh, he was one of the uh, young scholars uh, who were sent to Europe uh, immediately after the defeat of Japan in the war. And uh, he also uh, went out from Kobe and came back to Kobe. And he spent uh, four years in France. And he, he writes uh, in this uh, a collection of essays entitled Zashibun ka Nihon no Chisa na Kibo, Hybrid Culture, Japan Little Hope. Uh, this was written uh, 19, in 1956 after coming back. And he, he writes that when he was uh, staying in France, he was conscious solely about the contrast between, uh, between Japan and Europe. But when he came back, uh, he stopped by various ports uh, in Asia also. He came to sense that there are very interesting, clear differences among the Asian uh, uh, port cities like Hong Kong and Singapore, Shanghai. So when he landed at Kobe uh, port, uh, he found uh, Kobe, the atmosphere of Kobe is interesting in the sense it is a hybrid culture, you know. Just like uh, Singapore and uh, Shanghai and Hong Kong are also hybrid uh, culture, right? And uh, Kato Shuichi writes that he felt there are very interesting differences in hybridity. How these uh, different Asian uh, countries are hybrid culture. And the <coughs> what he uh, mean by hybrid culture doesn't mean that uh, there are all sorts of ethnic food available or ethnic groups, including Chinese people, are uh, living. But actually, very interestingly, I think, uh, he include Japan's so-called peace constitution as a product of Japan's hybrid culture, modern culture. So, and uh, he said, you might find the subtitle interesting, you know, Japan's little hope. <coughs> so, this means during the wartime, there was a very totalitarian, nationalistic, uh, Japan centrist ideology, right? So this emphasis or affirmative sort of a pre, uh, uh, affirmative evaluation of hybrid culture itself was a critique of the wartime ideology. And so <coughs> as the subtitle uh, says, According to uh, Kato Shuichi, Japan's post war Japan's hope should be sought or looked for in this possibility of hybrid culture. And uh, I think uh, we can place Rakami Haruki's sort of career along this side. This is my first uh, sort of reading. So let me sit down from here. So I hear that some of you are studying uh, literature. So have you read some works by Tanizaki Junichiro, for example, uh, Makioka Sisters? And Tanizaki also liked the area called Ashia, uh, near Kobe. And he, and if, if you like a 
Japanese sweets. There is a wonderful ja sweet sort of a shop uh, where Tanizaki, uh, uh, Tanizaki used to visit. And it is a very nice sweet. So uh, uh, I think if you have a chance to come over to uh, Kobe <coughs> for sightseeing, uh, you might want to visit it. <coughs> and uh, as for uh, Murakami Haruki, uh, he has written quite a number of essays, and which I find very interesting. And some of them have been translated into in English, and some have not. But one of the uh, essays, he sort of reflect back on his uh, school days in Kobe. Basically, he says he didn't like uh, the high school <laughs> uh, classes. But he said he read literally lots and lots of books. Re he was a very voracious reader. And he, uh, for example, he expresses, for example, uh, he writes, as if throwing books into a burning stove with a shovel. So burning stove was a metaphor for young Murakami. So this means Murakami Haruki read really lots and lots of books as if throwing them into a burning stove using a, a shovel, you know. And he, but he sort of reflecting on his, this, you know, reading uh, in his teenage years, uh, Murakami says uh, this was very important for him in the sense that he could be exposed to many uh, ways of thinking and feeling and many, cu many cultures. So uh, he could learn the importance of free spirit and the imagination <coughs> with many perspectives. And actually, after the uh, Fukushima disaster, nuclear disaster happened, Murakami Haruki says, actually, this was exactly what was lacking in Japanese society. That is a free imagination to think of a new, a different uh, sort of way of society, you know, not depending on nuclear uh, power generation. And another very distinctive uh, characteristic uh, sort of uh, episode or point about his uh, teen, uh, uh, teenage years is that he uh, encountered American jazz, also other kinds of uh, music, and he really uh, became absorbed in these musical uh, experiences. And, uh, but thirdly, there's a very serious uh, troubling uh, sort of uh, uh, element related to uh, the fact that he was raised in Kobe, uh, where uh, there's a Chinatown. And he, actually, uh, he writes that even today, he cannot eat Chinese food, Chinese dishes. And this is a very unconscious uh, sort of thing. And he, 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 even he himself doesn't know the reason. So um, there's a sort of an unconscious, sort of a uh, complicated, sort of a uh, emotional relationship with uh, China and Chinese people. And this comes up in a very enigmatic, hard to understand ways in his early short stories. And, uh, uh, but as we read along uh, his uh, recent long stories, we can, we can, I think we can see more clearly uh, why, uh, for, for example, he cannot eat Chinese food. You know, this is a very, strong thing, right? Uh, 
maybe most of you enjoy Chinese food, but he said he cannot eat without knowing. Uh, so there's a sort of a very interesting interview with a Japanese conductor, uh, Ozawa Seiji, uh, Dialogues. Uh, it's translated under the title, Absolutely on Music, Conversation with uh, Seiji Ozawa. Uh, I'd like to go deeper <laughs> into this quote, but maybe I will not have time. So, but let me uh, point out uh, the point. Uh, so let me read only the uh, blue uh, sentences. So Murakami says, so how did, how did I learn to write? From listening to music. And what's the most important thing in writing? It's rhythm. And the, so actually you, he uses the, the expression of polyrhythm. So rhythm can be produced from many uh, uh, sort of angles and uh, on many uh, dimensions. And the, this is a, a, one of the <coughs> part I find the most uh, interesting. Uh, so he talks about, about Mahler's music. And basically, uh, so uh, let me read just uh, the blue part. In Mahler's music, though, it feels as though he's deliber deliberately plunging down into the dark, into the subterranean underground realm domain of the mind, as if in a dream. You find many motifs that contradict one another, that are in opposition. So uh, this shows, I think, uh, Murakami Haruki really uh, feels sympathy with Mara's music for this reason. Yeah. And he, so, uh, maybe. So I think, in a sense, this is another sort of musical sort of expression of the cosmopolitan. Uh, sort of character of uh, Murakami Haruki's sort of uh, uh, bringing up. Uh, and uh, this is a, a very, uh, one of the sort of uh, core points I'd like to talk about today. Uh, about uh, it is related to China uh, problem uh, or the, the war. Or, well, this is from a uh, uh, you may know uh, the, he received the Jerusalem Award in 2009. So this is a part of the acceptance speech. Uh, he said, my father died last year at the age of 90. I used to see him every morning before breakfast, offering up long, deep felt prayers as a Buddhist altar in our house. Staring at his back as he knelt at the altar, I seemed to feel the shadow of death hovering around him. But the presence of death that lurked hidden, uh, was, uh, which was hiding about him, remains in my memory. It is one of the few things I carry on from him and one of the most important, the theme of relationship with the dead. Now actually some of the Japanese, uh, you may know, uh, uh, there are a huge uh, number of fans, right? Not only in Japan, but abroad, uh, fans of his uh, literature. Uh, but uh, among the literary critics, uh, it's been a very complicated issue in Japan, particularly. Uh, there has been a, a group of people who really uh, liked his works, but there were some others who really, uh, uh, who did not think his works uh, are worth sort of consideration. And, but some of the uh, uh, Japanese critics who really uh, values his works highly uh, also 
says that this question of the relationship with the dead people, dead, is really at the center of uh, Murakami Haruki's work all through. So I think but this also can be related to not to only the, the dead people, but also those people who disappear from our life without any reason, you know. There are many people in your life who, are, who have already disappeared, even if they are living, right? And the, so, Coming to Tokyo uh, from, uh, you notice, 1968. This is a very turbulent year all around the world. So uh, Murakami Haruki's friends at the university also were involved, and some of them even killed each other. So uh, this was really at the background of his uh, sort of concerns. And, and the, one of the things I, find, I found interesting is that uh, I think he was uh, majoring in uh, uh, theater at, at Waseda University. And, uh, but at that, and he was reading uh, many scenarios at uh, special libraries. And the uh, well, you know uh, scenarios of the famous movies, not looking at the movies themselves. So uh, this was interesting, isn't it? So he said, because there were no images, uh, just like in movies, he was reading just scenarios in words. So he had to use his imagination to uh, make the stories alive. So I think this was uh, the, uh, at the sort of base of his uh, work. And also this is a second point, is a, another very uh, well-known uh, fact among the uh, fans, at least. Uh, he did not work, he did not want to work for uh, as a sort of, you know, company workers. And uh, I think he uh, graduated after spending seven years uh, at Waseda University, uh, but uh, this was not an unusual case uh, uh, for this uh, uh, time. And he, so he started a jazz bar in Tokyo, and uh, the name of P uh, Peter Cat, you know, Cat, uh, Murakami Haruki loves Cat, right, Peter Cat. <coughs> and uh, you may have an image that, oh, Murakami Haruki had a jazz bar. It must have been a very fancy, nice, young ears. But uh, actually, uh, he writes, it was really, really hard working uh, several years. And uh, from morning until late night, he simply worked, 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 and to just to make a living. And But one day, uh, without knowing, he felt he wanted to write something. And this was the start. And he but so, so the first work was a Kaze no Taokike, Here the Winds Sing. And, uh, but when he uh, was writing this uh, first uh, story, Murakami, uh, he says, first, he did not know what he could write. And actually, he had nothing to write about. And uh, so, but eventually, he, uh, uh, he came to uh, think that, well, then, <coughs> let's write about the fact that I have nothing to write. And so he started right his life, and uh, but he didn't like the kind of uh, stories he could write in Japanese. So the next thing is very interesting. So he translated his own Japanese writing 
into English. And so, you know, uh, when you uh, try to express your ideas in foreign language, of course your ideas have to become very, have to become simplified, right? So this was what happened when he uh, translated his sentences into English. But actually, uh, he felt, oh, this is quite nice, actually. You know, simple words and very simple uh, grammar, and, but there's something going on. So he, then he translated it back into Japanese. And he said this was uh, the time when he felt that maybe he's, uh, he was beginning to obtain his own style. And uh, when he was working on this work, as, as I quoted, what he tried to do is to write sentences thinking of music, musical rhythm as model. So what is important is a, a, a linguistic rhythm that can be created. So uh, he repeatedly uh, says in his essays he uh, tried to write uh, just like to produce music. And the, so this was a, uh, the, here the wind thing, and fortunately it got a, a prize, literary prize, and uh, so after a a uh, couple of years, he decided to close the jazz club in order to devote himself to writing. And it was a you know, risky uh, bet. Uh, but it, and he actually, he came up uh, the wild sheep chase, and this was uh, uh, evaluated by some critics, so. <coughs> And another uh, point I, about uh, his life, I find very distinctive. Do you know what time, uh, what time he gets up every day? He writes he gets up every day around four in the morning. And after that, he just con uh, concentrates on his work. For, uh, for four or five years. And that's it. And, and after that, he does not work. And uh, he does what he does, listen to music, or do rat running. Mm -hmm. And uh, because he stopped hard working, he, he, he said he began, he began uh, gaining weight. So that is the reason why he started running. But uh, maybe some of you know uh, he's a really devoted runner, you know, right? Uh, he has partic participated in Boston Marathon and Hawaii Ma Honolulu Marathon. And so uh, he said, basically, uh, uh, on principle, uh, in principle, he has been running literally every day for the last more than 30 years. Of course, except uh, a few days. Um, so I think, but in a word, he said this kind of very, you know, ascetic, almost ascetic uh, <coughs> lifestyle is needed, is necessary for him to be able to uh, keep writing long stories. And the Let me, I think I, I have to go quickly, more quickly. So. Uh, after this, uh, he decided to uh, go to Europe, Greece, Italy, and the UK. And so here comes the Norwegian wood. And he, it uh, became a worldwide bestseller, right? And but actually, as I wrote, this Norwegian wood is a quite exceptional work Murakami Haruki's works. This is a very orthodox love story, in a sense, Norwegian world, and losing uh, lovers and losing friends. But think of other 
no long stories. It is very, you know, almost scientific, uh, scientific fiction-like stories, right? There are parallel worlds and uh, uh, the uh, uh, dead, pe the dead people coming back to this world, that kind of thing. But in that sense, uh, I think Norwegian wood is uh, exceptional, as he himself uh, says. So I think this is one of the reasons why I felt the gap or difference uh, in image I have. Uh, and he, so after this big success, he did not come back to Japan, and he went to US, and uh, he writes, you know, uh, when he was young, he was an individualist, of course. He did not want to, he did not want to work for companies, right? He, he was, uh, uh, sort of a, he was raised and he spent his student years in the 60s and 70s, right? So, but uh, when he went to the United States, he writes, individualism actually is all over. So nothing special about it. Uh, so he writes, he felt he has lost actually his objective purpose. So already everybody is leading a very individualist life in the United States of America. So then this was uh, started to change his mindset and also there were some other uh, factors and the, uh, the decisive factor is the 1995 uh, great earthquake in uh, Kobe and also the uh, sarin uh, poisonous gas attack that happened here in Tokyo uh, in the subway in 1995. And then he was in the US, uh, but I, I, he writes that uh, uh, becoming, uh, getting older, now he was feeling the so, sort of sense of responsibility for the community where, uh, from, uh, where he was born and raised. And, but I think the important point I think I, I, I got to emphasize is that it is not because of the Kobe earthquake or the uh, uh, Sarin uh, subway attack. Actually, already before that, uh, when he was uh, living in the United States, he was really uh, working <coughs> on the, one of the very the most atrocious uh, battles uh, just before the World War II. That happened in Mongolia. Uh, it's called No Mohan Battle. So the, uh, pa his personal change and also Japanese society change, I think, coincided. So as a product, after I came back, I think one of the a uh, rather controversial work he published was a, a collection of interviews with a victim of the Sarin attack in Tokyo, and also the, some of the uh, former New Religion cult uh, members. And also in 2000, he published a collection of short stories. Uh, in Japanese, uh, the title is Kami no Kodomo Tachi wa Mina Odoru. Uh, this is uh, not directly uh, takes up the earthquake, but uh, all the uh, stories are related to the people living after uh, the Kobe earthquake. So, this was an overall sort of a background or the career of uh, Murakami Haruki I wanted to present. And based on that, I'd like to focus on the uh, problem uh, Murakami Haruki uh, sort of, uh, uh, has been thinking on. And so to go to the uh, problem, so let me at first read uh, some quotes from underground. 
underground literally mean, meaning subway in Tokyo. And there is a very interesting uh, afterword, and it is most of it available in English translation. Uh, let me read the blue part only. So there's a section, the handed down self, the allotted narrative. So humans can't live very long without some sense of a continuing a story. Uh, they are crucial keys to sharing time experience with others. Now, a narrative is a story, not a logic, not ethics, nor a philosophy. I, I, I'd like to, something to say about this part uh, in the end, but at the end. But it is a dream you keep having, whether you realize it or not. Storyteller and at the same time character uh, in uh, stories, you are storyteller of your own story, also you are at the same time character of your story, you are living or you are dreaming. So it is through such multi-learning of roles in our stories that we heal the loneliness of being an isolated individual in the world. So he goes on, just what kind of narrative? Anyway, most people are tired of complex multi scenarios. <coughs> they are potential let down, so the source of disappointment. It's precisely because people can't find any fixed point within their multi schemes that they are tossing aside their self-identity. Such was the narrative offered by Om, Om Shinrikyo, uh, you know, uh, in Japanese society, it's a sort of repeated sort of a, a part of the modern history, but just in case, uh, briefly, uh, 1995, uh, I think, uh, the new religious uh, cult group called Om, uh, Om Shinrikyo, Om uh, Truth uh, uh, Religion, they they have been causing uh, uh, problems, but uh, some members uh, uh, killed many people uh, who were just uh, passengers in the Tokyo subway by, uh, uh, sort of, uh, by uh, using uh, the very strong uh, poison, uh, sarin. And, the, and what was traveling to lots of Japanese people, scholars also, was the fact that the, the lots of the members of this uh, religious cult were the students who were graduate uh, from very good universities in Tokyo, and not even in natural sciences, and from Tokyo University. And so the question was, why in the first, why on, uh, on, on earth these young Japanese people could follow the story narrative provided by the, the leader, uh, Asahara Shoko? It was a very uh, simple, uh, very hard to believe story. Uh, that is, uh, there comes, uh, you know, Harmageddon the last end of the world war. And the, all the evil people uh, have to die. And uh, so these are, they are, they have right to kill these people, actually to save their souls. So they felt, <coughs> some of the members, and just like of your age, you know, uh, students and uh, young graduate students, and they felt they have right to kill other Japanese people in order to save Japanese society and the world. And uh, so 
they had been given the religious sort of justification for this kind of act. So this was a, uh, what Murakami Haruki was troubled by too, you know. It was because it was about narrative <coughs> stories, you know. Uh, the fact that so many young Japanese students uh, could be attracted to this kind of, you know, apparently uh, irrational uh, stories and uh, narratives. So uh, he goes on to ask, but were we able to offer them, the young Japanese uh, people, a more viable, more sort of, a, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, more, more valuable, more uh, sort of, uh, the having more power to be a more viable nar narrative. Did we have a narrative story, uh, potent, strong enough to chase away Asahara, uh, the leader's uh, utter nonsense? That was a big task. And it's something I'm going, uh, yeah, let me read the uh, black part because this is really uh, at the center of, uh, I am a novelist. And as well as, uh, and as we all know, a novelist is someone who works with narratives, who spins stories professionally, which meant to me that the task at hand was like a gigantic sword dangling above, above my head. It's something I'm going to have to deal with much more seriously from here on. I know. I'm going to have to con construct a cosmic communication device of my own. I'll probably have to piece together every last scrap of junk, every weakness, every deficiency inside me to do it. There I've gone and said it, but the real surprise is that it's exactly what I've been do trying to do as a writer all alone. So then, what about? I'm using the second person, but of course that it includes me. So I, I, of course he is saying that this question is not a question for him himself only as a novelist, but to you, uh, it, it's being addressed to you, everybody. So uh, he goes on to write, uh, what can I do? I, did, I decided to write this book because in short, I have, to, I have always wanted to understand Japan at a deeper, deeper level. I've been living abroad, away from the country, for a long time, seven or eight years, first in Europe and then America. To my surprise, it was only during the last two years of my exile that I discovered I urgently wanted to know about that country called Japan. I could feel the change inside me, an ongoing revaluation of my values. I was to, underst to under understate the obvious, no longer that young, and by the same token, uh, in this, I suddenly know I was entering the ranks of that generation with a vested duty toward Japanese society. Not because, of course, uh, he, uh, Murakami Haruki, was becoming a nationalist, but simply because it was a community uh, into which he was born and he was raised. Um, so, uh, I'm going to the uh, last part, so uh, uh, could you be a little bit more uh, 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 patient with me? So, overwhelming violence. So, actually, the question of violence uh, is really one of the central questions for, for him, as he himself uh, highlights. 
The Kobe earthquake and the Tokyo gas attack of January and March are two of the gravest, gravest tra tragedies in Japan's post-war history. But actually, uh, as you know, after this, uh, there was a uh, uh, Fukushima uh, nuclear and uh, earthquake a tsunami disaster, uh, 2011, right? So actually, uh, this was not the last most serious uh, tragedies. And so, uh, Murakami Haruki also uh, had to think about more sort of uh, serious uh, situations, including the uh, nuclear power generation, but uh, for today, uh, let's concentrate on uh, this, uh, the time around 1995. So, so it is no exaggeration to say that there was a marked change in Japanese consciousness before and after these events. These twin catastrophes will remain embedded in our psyche as two milestones in our life as a people. Uh, going to the blue part, they ushered in, uh, they introduced a period of critical inquiry into the very roots of Japanese state, Japanese uh, society. And the, both were nightmarish eruptions, explosions beneath our feet from underground. You may, you notice, uh, he uses uh, underground here to, you know, the earthquakes and the, these uh, natural uh, sort of disasters, that through all the latent contradictions and weak points of our society into fright frighteningly high relief. Uh, in, uh, in other words, these uh, incidents highlighted were brought into light the weakest points in Japanese society and culture, according to his understanding. So, Japanese society proved, turned out, all too defenseless against these sudden onslaught attacks. We were unable to see them coming and failed to prepare, nor did we respond effectively. Very clearly, our side failed. That is, the narrative imagination that most Japanese embraced or uh, had or thought they shared as common images failed to provide, it, provide a set of values which could countervail or compete against, effectively against the brutal violence uh, it, that exploded under us. Um, so let me uh, conclude these. Uh, this is a, um, one of the sort of the dialogues uh, published and translated into English too. Is a very interesting dialogue with a, a Jungian a psychologist uh, uh, Hayao Kawaii, and here. Uh, Murakami Haruki also talks about violence. Ultimately, Japan's biggest problem is that the war ended, but we never had an opportunity to process the overwhelming violence that occurred during the war. Everyone acted as if, like they were victims, and th their real feelings were replaced with extremely ambiguous phrases like, we must never repeat this mistake again. This is a very famous uh, sort of uh, inscription, right? And uh, you can find on the uh, memorial stone uh, in Hiroshima, right? And uh, no one ever look, uh, uh, no one ever took any personal internal responsibility for the mechanisms that created the violence. Well, um, some, some may say that no one, uh, is a 
too much uh, generalization, but I think the problems of my generation are also rooted in this. My generation, which grew up with a pacifist constitution, was raised on these, on three principles. Peace should come first, never repeat the same mistake again, and we have denounced war. When we were children, that was okay. These things in themselves are admirable notions, ideas, ideas. But as we grew up, we discovered endless contradictions and discrepancies that's what lead to the riots in 1968 and 1969. So when I look at Japanese society, I think that righteousness without pain or hardship is not righteousness, uh, meaning that the very reasonable and very understandable sort of uh, ideas are themselves very precious ideas, but Murakami Hariki wants to emphasize that we, at the, time, at the same time, we really think about the actual sort of violence uh, in the modern Japanese history also with a potential uh, sort of a, uh, of violence we may be have inside ourselves, each of us. So today, more than ever, we as a society don't seem to know where we are headed. This is because we haven't properly dealt with the past. And uh, you may say this is not really uh, Murakami's unique sort of view, but uh, one of the shared critical, uh, self-critical views uh, among uh, Japanese. And uh, thinking back on the Wind Up Bird Chronicle now, <coughs> in which uh, Murakami Haruki uh, wrote about, describes, uh, the you know the no more harm so battle uh, in 1939 and very violent descriptions and some of my foreign students say they do not really like it and they do not they say they do not really understand why Nakami Haruki has to write this kind of you know really violent uh, things but. Uh, but I am slowly starting to make sense of it. First, I came to my own personal understanding of historical violence, and now I'm at a point where I have to fi figure out which direction I should go, go in next, but I don't know exactly where this will lead me. Uh, and the, actually, uh, I, want, I wanted to share with you some of the uh, very uh, impressive scenes, uh, very distinctive scenes in the recent work, one of the relatively recent work, Kafka on the show, uh, Umibe no Kafka. Uh, I think if you read, uh, you know that there's a what descriptions of very violent uh, acts and the uh, very tortures of the killing of the cats, uh, cats Murakami Haruki loves. And uh, you may be really astonished or uh, at the sort of violent sort of nature of the pages. But I think on seeing from the Murakami Haruki side, uh, when we think, uh, knowing the fact that actually, uh, you know, uh, he had been interested in the, what actually happened in Mongolia in 1939, no uh, in Japan it's, it's known as a Nomohan Jiken uh, or Nomohan Senso. But actually this was a really terrible, terrible uh, battle 
So I think uh, Murakami Haruki may respond that actually you might find uh, his writing too violent in some places, but actually to think you, we need to think uh, back on what happened. Mm. And, and this is the last point I want to sort of introduce. And the, uh, one of the uh, very sort of distinctive, uh, very strong uh, sort of uh, uh, pages, for example, in Kafka on the show, I think is uh, where he describes uh, people running or people walking very fast or even uh, driving a car. And uh, I think uh, he is really good at these uh, uh, sort of descriptions. I think which is, you know, uh, which come from his own sort of uh, fascination with running and driving a car and et cetera. And uh, so I, I, maybe I should not read, but let me point out that toward the end of the Kafka on the show, uh, there's a very symbolic sort of uh, scenes where the, his sort of concern with uh, Japan's past uh, during the war and also uh, the, uh, his sort of uh, uh, concern with the dead uh, people or uh, come together in a very interesting, uh, very uh, artistic way. Uh, so, and basically, uh, this is uh, what I had. Uh, I, and I want what I wanted to uh, share with you. Uh, I, I'm not sure I could, uh, I could, uh, I could uh, sort of convey my points well or not. But uh, yeah, let me stop here. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, patience. I would like to thank Professor Kazushi for his long lecture, a very insightful lecture, and I would like to open the floor for questions and comments. Um, thank you very much for your very interesting uh, lecture. And I have one comment and one uh, question. And my comment is that, um, you know, um, Murakami was born in 1949, and Asahara was um, born in 1955. So there may be some kind of a general, general generation, small generation gap between them. And also um, the main um, high-ranking disciples um, who um, exalted Dan Fuha, who did a Sarikas attack, uh, were a little bit more younger. And it, it is um, you know, my age, like a 1958 or 1959. So, so um, in this, in, in this end, there is a 10-year generation gap between Murakami and those high-ranking uh, believers. Okay, so when I feel that when Murakami uh, writes my generation, so it might be a little bit, little bit you know, we have, it, it should be um, good um, to, uh, we have a little bit doubt about his um, understanding. Uh, so I am very, uh, yes, I, so, mm, I'm curious about his um, thought on those um, gender, gender gap between mm, 1948 generation and after uh, the other uh, generation who were 10 years or so younger than Murakami's generation. And this is my comment. So my question is that I read um, this year I forget, but in my Nichi Shimbo, my Nichi newspaper, uh, he, write, he wrote about the execution of an old Shimiko Asara and the disciples. And there, there he showed a kind of a re reluctant support on capital punishment. Yes. 
So when reading uh, his essay, I was uh, shocked to know uh, that oh, he support, uh, ho however reluctantly, but I, yeah, I had a kind of a shock, shock, and this was a shocking event for me. So do you have some comment on his idea, his opinion on capital punishment and its relationship with uh, his, um, hmm, for example, his um, idea of violence or the value of human life and so on and so on. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Murioka-sensei. Uh, thank you very much for coming in the first place. Uh, actually, about the generation, uh, the, uh, the, I wanted to say something uh, about the much later generation and the, uh, how uh, his works were read by uh, the Japanese critics and scholars now uh, in their 30s or in uh, 40s. But let me uh, go to your question first. And uh, uh, at first, uh, to some of you, uh, the, as uh, Morioka Sensei uh, explained, uh, you know, uh, the those uh, who committed this uh, uh, poisonous gas attack in 1995 here in Tokyo were uh, executed, you know, uh, capital punishment, illegal. And this became a controversy recently in Japan again, uh, because for one thing, uh, you know, lots of European countries are opposed to capital punishment, right? But Japan is still continuing to uh, uh, sort of conduct carry out this uh, capital punishment. So this itself has been a very uh, serious uh, sort of uh, problem. And the, so when the, the, the leader of this uh, 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 case, uh, for one thing, not only one, but the, the Japanese government and Ministry of Justice decided to uh, execute uh, almost uh, the uh, more than ten people uh, in a short span of time. So it was a sort of a show of execution of people. So and it, it, there was a very uh, serious critique, especially from the uh, European countries, which have already abolished uh, punish, uh, capital punishment. That you, you know, Japanese government is still doing this kind of thing and. Uh, in this way, in a very political way. So and the, then uh, Murakami Haruki was asked to uh, contribute a short uh, essay to a newspaper, one of the most well-known newspaper, Manich. And so in which uh, Murakami said, uh, Morioka Sensei said, you know, uh, Murakami Haruki said, to be frank, I know that as a sort of idea, legal idea, the capital punishment should be abolished, but because uh, he attended the you know, uh, uh, laws and the sort of uh, the exchange of views at court, uh, this sort of legal case uh, lasted for a long time. So a uh, lot of the people went to the court in Tokyo to listen to the exchange of legal debates. And uh, Murakami Haruki one of the, those people. So uh, Murakami Haruki said uh, because he uh, was exposed to the kind of sort of a uh, mm, sort of an argument presented by the victims' families. He, uh, he write, wrote, uh, he is very reluctant uh, to say that uh, capital uh, punishment 
should not have been uh, carried out. Uh, so this was the point. And the, uh, I think, uh, I think the point of uh, Morioka Sensei is that I think even if uh, one felt a hesitation or reluctance or a, a, a sort of a, a wavering sort of a, a mind, I think as a conclusion, I think uh, Murakami Haruki uh, nonetheless uh, made it clear that uh, he was uh, opposed to the capital punishment. And the, uh, I basically agree, uh, but uh, if I can, if I may say, uh, I think as a novelist, I think, uh, you know, having uh, interviews with uh, the uh, victims, and the uh, uh, pub uh, publishing uh, underground as uh, a collection of interviews, I think, uh, in a sense, I think uh, I can uh, sympathize with the fact that he felt a very deep, uh, troubling sort of uh, uh, hesitation. Uh, uh, but, uh, mm. So personally, I think uh, I wish also he could say as a conclusion uh, a clear sort of principled sort of opposition to the capital punishment. And the, but I think uh, if I uh, sort of try to uh, stand on his sort of side, I think he wanted to. Uh, express or share uh, what he experienced when he was uh, listening to the victims' families, and and I'm sure this was a, a satisfying as answer to your very difficult question. What about the generation? Yeah. Uh, I didn't think about the generation gap between the Murakami Haruki himself and uh, these uh, own uh, people and uh, uh, disciples. Uh, but uh, so I'd like to think about it. But what I had in mind is that uh, the uh, so in the last part uh, I wanted to sort of uh, uh, add present a sort of critical sort of, uh, sort of uh, uh, views, if there was a time, and uh, that was uh, what I said about the sort of critical sort of uh, uh, reactions coming out from the younger sort of uh, uh, generation of uh, Japanese critics in their thirties and in early forties, uh, and uh, I think uh, interestingly, uh, some of the Japanese very well known, uh, very uh, creative. Uh, critics, uh, they used to really like uh, Murakami's early works, but now they, some of them uh, said that the, regarding the recent works, they are really getting more and more disappointed. So the reason is, I think, is related to, has to do with uh, generations. I think uh, they say that actually up to the, uh, the around 1995, actually Murakami Haruki's sort of a, uh, thinking or uh, sensitivities was very, uh, how to say, in close uh, relationship with uh, what's going on actually in Japanese society. But after that, and uh, although I. In his thinking, Murakami Haruki is trying to cope with, for example, what happened after Fukushima. But I think some Japanese young critics say, I think maybe uh, Murakami Haruki is getting out of tune with the contemporary present uh, Japanese society. 
And the, so I, I, actually, I uh, I tend to uh, agree with these uh, younger generations and critics. So you introduced a comment by Murakami which says that narrative as a life guiding uh, meaning forming story is not logic or philosophy nor ethics. So you said that you have some comments about it, so could you elaborate a little yeah. about it? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, actually, when this uh, almost uh, sort of 1990, Five uh, poison gas attack happened in 1995. I was teaching in Hiroshima, and uh, in a, so I, I had to talk about it in my lectures and the seminars. And uh, at that time, I did not think of, uh, of a sort of alternative narratives, but I, I thought I uh, sort of philosophical questioning can be a way to counter uh, the very bad narratives. And uh, that is to say, and this is uh, what I'm thinking uh, still, that is to say, uh, there's a philosophy of narratives. But actually, philosophy itself is not a narrative. I think uh, it can be told in a narrative. But I think, uh, as you know, the beginning of uh, uh, philosophical questioning is a sort of uh, wonder or surprise at uh, uh, the being of the world. And I think in that sense, uh, so philosophical thinking and questioning uh, starts at the point where narratives uh, cannot be at least easily given. And uh, they, uh, it starts at the limit of the uh, uh, sort of a, uh, human thinking. So I think uh, in the case of Murakami Haruki, I think he is uh, trying to uh, come up with an alternative, sort of different kinds of uh, narratives to uh, deal with these problems in Japanese society. I think, uh, I, I'm not against it, but I think uh, as a sort of philosophy scholar, I think uh, philosophy or philosophical questioning uh, can be uh, at least one of the uh, ways to uh, counter uh, the problem. And the, uh, I'm not sure I, I, my response makes sense. Uh, there could be some objection to the effect that philosophical discourse could be one of the narratives. Yes. So what do you say to this statement? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, uh, philosophy of narrative and uh, sort of, uh, uh, philosophy as a narrative, I think they are related, uh, can be related. And, but uh, what I wanted to sort of uh, emphasize well, is a point that uh, for example, to put it uh, in a concrete example, uh, for example, what, do you know some of the Japanese students, do you remember why these young Japanese people, uh, even majoring in natural sciences, were attracted to uh, 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 Asahara Shoko. The one was uh, that the Asahara Shoko claimed that he could perform a miraculous sort of thing, you know, uh, 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 keeping his, bo his body uh, floating on the ground or uh, something like that. So, but I, I, I thought uh, in philosophy, the kind of wonder, or the kind of, sort of astonishment uh, that are in question is not some particular uh, strange phenomenon, but the very fact that we are living 
and the world exist. And we don't know why, right? So we, we are living, but actually if we are asked, we don't know why we came to a being, came into being in the first place. So in that sense, the living life itself and the, the existence of the world itself is a miraculous thing, right? So uh, in that sense, I, I felt that these followers of this uh, religious cult, they were not uh, understanding this level of uh, sort of a, a surprising sort of a, a wonder. They, they were attracted to the very specific pseudo or fake uh, wonders. So these uh, pseudo particular uh, wonders uh, surprises were part of the, uh, the analogy. Other questions or comments? I'm curious, you know, uh, uh, there must be some really great fan of uh, Murakami Haruki. Uh, in, Jap in Japan, uh, uh, there's a uh, term uh, Harukist. Uh, I guess there are some Harukist here. And uh, I'm curious how uh, you found my t today's sort of, you know, overall characterization. And actually, you know, uh, this is uh, one of the, I think, uh, at the moment, this is a very sort of a, how do you say, uh, persuasive and uh, uh, way to understand what he is struggling with. But actually, uh, the one, as I said, even among Jap uh, Japanese sort of uh, uh, scholars and people, there are all sorts of, uh, sort of uh, uh, views. And uh, uh, some of the uh, Japanese scholars who were great fan of Murakami Haruki uh, when uh, Murakami Haruki was writing his early works, some of them say they really became disappointed when Murakami Haruki started becoming social, you know. And uh, it's, so I think that there can be all sorts of uh, uh, ways to read, of course. Yeah. I guess I'll, I'll use the remaining time for a short comment and a question. A lot of uh, topics were raised. Um, the human propensity towards committing acts of violence. You started off the talk with referring to the theme of relationship toward or with the dead. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, please correct me if I'm wrong. This, also, this is also something that Shuichi Kato has been uh, deeply uh, has been involved in and toward the end of the uh, your talk there was a passage I'll paraphrase that uh, so the relationship with the dead and then he says as a society we don't know where we're headed today I he refers to the Japanese society but I guess this applies to any society in the world because we haven't properly dealt with the past and the past is filled with the dead so um, I just wanted to ask you, what do you make of this? And uh, I think it's very interesting and deep point. And we can see that it's a recurring theme uh, as well in Haruki Murakami's work. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as we know, you know, even now, I think. Uh, uh, the relationship between Japan and the Korea, especially, uh, is getting really, really serious, right? Because of the past problem, history. And uh, so this is not the problem for, uh, the, uh, the problem only Murakami Haruki is, uh, can be conscious of. And the, also, the, this question of the, the debt is also uh, actually especially after the Fukushima disaster, uh, has become one of the focal points of the uh, people's uh, concern. 
you know, uh, the, not only in philosophy and sociology and also literature, poetry. And in a world, for example, in philosophy, and actually this uh, sort of question about the, the debt uh, has, is not something that came up recently. And uh, uh, even there was a uh, thinking about this question during the wartime too. And, but particularly now, for example, the, put it uh, simply, for example, Japanese philosopher, for example, Tanabe said, uh, uh, so we we tend to think in sort of a uh, in a very clear cut ways. Something is existing or something is not existing. But in the case of the that, that dead people, it is very difficult for us human beings to how to uh, regard the existence of the dead people. So in a normal sense, we of course think that the dead people do not exist any longer. But still, uh, we, we hold uh, memorial services and we go to the, uh, the uh, tombs. And uh, in that sense, we keep, sort of, uh, we keep uh, being concerned about the dead people. So in that sense, I think we are, uh, we continue uh, holding and uh, developing a relationship with the dead people who are, in an ordinary sense, not existing. So in this sense, I think, uh, to another uh, concrete example, I think, uh, not only Murakami Haruki, there are some, quite a number, some uh, Japanese sort of people and scholars and uh, uh, psychologists also uh, who have been thinking about this. That is, what happened to those Japanese people who went to, for example, China and the Asian countries and who fought there and who came back to Japan, just like the father of Murakami Haruki. And so, and for example, there was, there was a sort of a expression of a loss of sorrow among these people. And so and there has been a psychological problem, but I think, in a positive note, I think a very recently uh, there has been a sort of a a study and a sort of a, a report about uh, what, for example, Japanese soldiers really uh, felt and experienced during the war. And for example, Japanese soldiers are very uh, brave soldiers of the very godlike country Japan, and that kind that kind of image has been binding uh, our understanding. But actually. Lots of Japanese soldiers, young people who went to China, who had to uh, fight China. Fighting was horrifying. And some of them were devastated. And some of them <coughs> also went mad crazy. And some of them had to be hospitalized. And, but these histories have, have not been discussed in Japan until recently, openly. But I think one of the things coming out, and uh, there's a, uh, some special TV program about this. So I think I, I want to say that this question uh, of the relationship with the dead is not really a special case for Murakami Haruki and his father. But I, I think uh, it is a, uh, it may be, hard to recognize on the daily life, but I think it is a very uh, ongoing undercurrent in Japanese uh, post-war uh, society and uh, mentality. Yeah. So we're right on time, 8.30. Thank you all for coming, and I would like to uh, thank the speaker today.